Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Strategic Design for Successful Casting with Doug Napier. During this session, Doug is going to reveal tactical design techniques that enable successful casting. He'll dive into how design plays a role in the success of your casting, let you in on tips and tricks to designing with casting in mind, and share how to overcome casting challenges. All right, Doug, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Well, hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Doug Napier. Um, I'm a uh, jewelry maker. I've been a jewelry, I guess, a technical model maker for uh, a number of years. I started making jewelry in the, the mid 1980s and uh, um, just kind of along my journey. When I when I first started, the the owner of the company and, and just kind of seen something in me that he liked. So he taught me all the aspects of jewelry making. And I uh, eventually ended up as a kind of a technical model maker. And over the years, I've worked for you know, some, some pretty good sized companies all over the world, both as a, uh, a model maker, uh, manager, and also a consultant. And uh, now I've uh, opened up my own little shop in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, which is fortunately uh, the same town as B9. So we built a pretty good relationship over the years, um, working with, with a lot of their product and, and uh, kind of leaning on one another to, to help, um, uh, just kind of help us each other along. So, so I've, I've worked with B9 for um, quite a few years. Um, also, you know, testing some of their product, helping them out, uh, giving them advice and stuff like that so it's kind of kind of a nice uh, nice place to be so actually i'm here at their their uh, studio today so which is nice i could have done it at my place but there's so much going on all the time that uh, it it uh, was just a lot easier to, to do it here so so again i uh, said so i've been a, a a jewelry model maker long before i ever got into cad um, design which which i started getting into cad in like the late 1990s um, doing CAD and, and mill work and then when the 3D printers come along um, just started um, experimenting and, and doing some some stuff with that as well so I don't really consider myself an expert but um, I've just um, been at it long enough that uh, I kind of work around problems that I find and usually I find a solution you know I, I uh, probably cast three or four times a week with uh, you know, the resin. And uh, there's just some, some things that I've learned to do and not to do um, just to avoid some of the problems that, uh, that we go. Um, like, so uh, let's see, you know, like I said, I, I've, you know, luckily I've been a, a jewelry maker before I ever got into CAD, which a lot of times I, I see some problems of, of people, they, they create these amazing um, looking jewelry pieces, but they really have never been at the bench to um, to see how that comes to reality. Um, you know, most of the people out there, they're, they work in shops and, and they're, you know, doing custom jobs all the time. But a lot of the people that, that I run into that, that seem to be the biggest problem is they, uh, they've never actually sat down and, and created a whole bunch of jewelry. So the, uh, the, the CAD pieces that they make are, um, you kind of scratch your head and go, I have no idea how that's gonna work, but you know, let's kind of tackle it and, and see how we can make it as close to reality as possible. So, so, uh, so one of the things I, I like to do is, I, a lot of people talk in absolutes and, and with me, I, I try not to. Because there's always things that I think you can do or you can't do that uh, um, you can work around. So, so for me, it's it's about setting a baseline that that works um, to make sure that you try and replicate that baseline as close as possible from day to day. And if there's any problems that come up, then it's looking at the the process and saying, okay, what changed in this process that's giving me a different result than I had yesterday? So yesterday it was successful, today it's not. Something changed um, as long as you have a monitored baseline. And, and that's just kind of keeping 
things the same from day to day. Um, but you're going to come up with things that that uh, break down in the system. So you're going to kind of almost be like a uh, a troubleshooter or a you know a crime scene investigator. If, so, if, a, if a problem comes up, it's like okay, this is like a crime scene. What changed to cause this? A lot of times it's the the uh, design. But sometimes if you're not monitoring that process closely, then you really don't have an idea. You know, so, so some of the variables that you can control, you want to make sure that you, you stay constant. Say, um, you know, using the, the, the same mixture of uh, investment in water, using the same temperature of water, using the same um, flask size um, Things that you can control, you want to control as close as possible. Um, you know, it, a lot of times where I'm casting, I'm, I'm doing two or three rings at a time. So, so I'll use a small flask and uh, um, I, I've got certain uh, measurements that I use every single time. So I know that if it doesn't turn out, that usually didn't cause the problem. The same thing with the water. Um, I use room temperature water. You know, I, I set aside water just for casting. I don't use tap water um, because you, can, you can't control the temperature um, and stuff. So, so again, um, it's, it's just controlling the things that you can. And then when things don't uh, turn out as planned, then, then figuring out, okay, what changed and, and how can we go about uh, fixing that? Um, a, a lot of the problems that I see in the casting process is people will, will show me images and they saying I'm having um, porosity issues in my casting. And one of the things that people need to do is learn how to identify those problems because there's a difference between um, porosity, um, there's inclusions like on these pictures there it's kind of switched around the first picture should be the inclusions uh, the second one is is porosity uh, a third one might be um, just surface um, reaction to the investment um, from uncured resin or something like that so so one of the things you have to do is is familiarize yourself with the problem of the casting surface is it true porosity um, shrinkage porosity or gas porosity or is it something a little bit different? Like the one on the on the left is is actually inclusions, and what that is is um, things that are getting into your metal. Usually, it's investment. Um, some of the older resins that might have been resin residue um, that accumulates in certain areas. So so familiarize yourself with um, troubleshooting what the, the real problem is. Don't just say, you know, I cast this piece and I'm getting porosity. So who do I call? You know, so do a little bit of investigating. If you got a microscope, kind of dive into it and see exactly what, um, what the problem is. If it's porosity, usually it's really small, um, like almost sponge type surface. Uh, and it will usually happen in the thickest area just because the way when metal goes from a liquid state to a uh, solid state, when it's, when it's making that transition, it's actually shrinking just a little bit. And what it wants to do is it wants to pull molten metal into that area that it's shrinking. So um, if, if you have a piece that say you got a thick area that's cut off from the rest of the piece, that's not screwed there. Then um, when that, metal goes from a uh, liquid state to a solid state and there's nothing for it to draw into itself, then it has a breakdown and that's where you see the, the casting porosity. So you, you, you know, it looks like a good piece and then you go to clean it up and polish it and all of a sudden you've got this, this little pits and, and, and a surface area that you can't get shiny. It's just, it's embedded all the way through. So it's not just on the surface, but it's um, all the way through your metal. And there's, there's ways to get around porosity. You can get, you know, um, burnishers and, and porosity beaters, what they call them, and take that metal that's around it and smear it over those pits um, so that it'll hold a high polish. The, the metal is still embedded with those small areas, but um, you, you can figure out ways to, to hide them. And that's, 
what you would do with, with the porosity. The inclusions are something different. Usually the inclusions are, like I said, broken off pieces of investment that get into your metal. And, and one, of the, one of the things we'll dive into today is, is how to identify that and how to um, remedy it before it happens. A lot of the times the inclusions that you'll see, especially in, in resin casting, there'll be um, certain shapes. It's not like random shapes, but it's like rectangles and squares. And, and most of the times you'll see it when you're doing like pieces that have a lot of stone settings or a lot of fine work or even text. Say if you, you know, create some coins or something like that that has a lot of text in it, you cast it up and you'll look at where the text is um, and some of the, the text areas are broken out and they fill in. And you think, you know what, oh, darn, I got to go in and fill it. But when you don't realize is when those little pieces break off, that's investment breaking off. And when that metal comes in there, it's taking those things and it's floating them around and they come to rest at odd places. So you'll, you'll see these, again, rectangle and square shaped um, defects or inclusions in your casting. And that's just um, the investment that's broken off and, and gotten into there. So, so again, um, when the, the casting, you want to control as many things as you can. Um, and, and then also learn how to identify the problems that you come up with. And, and then once you've identified them, then you can start figuring out ways um, of making sure that they don't happen. Um, so for the inclusions, um, one of the things that you can do is is know where your problems are going to lie. So if you have uh, a piece that has text in it, um, most of the problems I see is, is people use the text a little bit deeper than it really needs to be. You know, you don't need to go two millimeters deep with text when a half a millimeter will get by because when resin goes through the, the stage of, of burning out, it's not like wax where when you, when you burn out wax, it's just going to get hot and it's going to melt and turn into a liquid and drain out and then burn off. With resin, there's a transformation stage that goes on and I, I don't know exactly the temperature, but it's right around 700 degrees or so. And what it'll do is instead of melting and, and coming out, it'll actually swell a little bit before it breaks down and burns out. And, and during that process of that transformation from a solid resin to whatever it does, um, it, it again, it swells just a little bit. And if you've got any really small holes, um, any small um, pieces in, in lettering or or through holes when your stone settings and stuff like that, those are going to be affected. The, the thinner they are, the more they're gonna be affected by that, that transformation kind of swell. And, and if you've got uh, um, like little pieces, they'll end up snapping off because that swelling will just, um, it'll shear them, them uh, pieces of investment off because investment's not very strong. Uh, there's things that you can add to it to make it a little bit stronger, but, um, there's limits to that as well. So, so again, um, usually what I would do is when I'm doing lettering, instead of having the lettering go straight down and have a flat bottom, what I'll do is I'll taper it just a little bit so that it's a little thicker at the base and a little thinner at the, I guess, the bottom, which would be the top of the investment. And then also, instead of having right angles, go in and, and fillet those edges just a little bit so that, uh, um, so that it'll be a little bit stronger. Here's, here's a, a piece that we were talking about uh, earlier. When you get into porosity, um, this piece is, is fairly solid. So if you look where the sprue is attached, that's the thickest part of that design. Um, if most people would take this design and they would sprue it on the bottom of the shank because it's the easiest place to clip and grind, but they don't realize that when um, they cast this piece, the thickest area is going to solidify last. And if it doesn't have a place to feed, then you're gonna get porosity in that. So 
So here I go and I sprue it from the thickest area and also make sure that there's a, another feeder sprue to the other side. Otherwise, if I cast it, it's going to um, be clean on one side and the other side will have a little bit of porosity. So, so I wanna make sure that I, I sprue to the thickest area. Now with, with wax, you can get away with you know, one or two sprues, but, but with resin, I tend to really oversprue the piece. Any piece or place in that piece that looks like it's gonna be a problem area, I'll add sprues to it. And I'll kind of explain why I do that later, but, but um, you, you really wanna think oversprueing when you're dealing with resin, just because of, um, again, that swell, and you wanna relieve some of that pressure of when that, when that piece swells a little bit. So, so uh, um, let's see what we got here next. Um, Again, so, so the, the whole part process of that sprueing, it's called directional solidification. You can do a kind of a study on that. But again, what it talks about is the, the thickest area of, an, of a piece is going to solidify last. And you wanna make sure that as that shrinks and draws metal into itself, that you've got a pool of metal that goes and fills that area. Because you can't get away from shrinkage porosity. Um, it's gonna show up. Uh, but, but if you design the piece and the tree right, your shrinkage porosity is going to show up either in the sprue or in the, the main tree base itself. And that's how you want to design it. So, so that's why you know, if you look at it, it's called a tree for a reason because it, it's thick and then it slowly thins out and thins out and thins out until it gets to the pieces. So, um, so just kind of think about that. You don't want to have thicker areas that aren't cut off from feed. Uh, so, so usually when I, I'm getting ready to cast a, a piece of resin, you'll see this stuff here, it's called sticky wax. If you just take regular wax from a wax pen and try and adhere it to your resin, it'll stick, but um, it doesn't have a good bond. Sticky wax is called sticky wax because it's sticky wax. You heat it up and it's almost like glue. So it'll stick to um, whatever you put it to a lot better than just regular wax. Um, so if you just take a regular um, sprue rod and try and attach it to resin, it, it's gonna stay. But during the investment process, when you're um, pulling a vacuum and vibrating the table and stuff like that, some of those times those pieces will break off because it's not a good bond. So this is the, the sticky wax that I use and I've never had a piece break off, so. Um, that uh, that that stuff works really good. And then what I'll do is I'll put a little bit of sticky wax to the piece and then I'll heat up the sprue and attach it to the sticky wax. Let's see, let's see, let's see if I can get rid of this. There we go. Yeah, so you can see on the on the far right, it's actually a couple of sprues that I put together because I wanna make sure that that area is is thicker than the ring itself. So, so instead of finding a big old sprue, I just add a couple of them together and make sure that the, the total um, area thickness is thicker than the piece that I'm attaching it to. So, so you, you definitely want to think about that. And this is just one, it's, it's working with filling the piece, but two, making sure that the, the shrinkage porosity is at a minimum. And you're gonna run into you know, shrinkage porosity all the time, especially if you're working with big pieces and signets and, and big areas that, that need a lot of polishing. Um, it's just you know, part, of the, part of the business. You, you're always gonna to have to deal with some sort of porosity at some point. So um, if you can do things just to minimize that as much as possible, then, uh, then it, makes it, it makes it work a lot easier. So. So um, let's see what we got for the next slide. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about. Um, when, when I go in for lettering, um, you can see you don't necessarily need to go really deep with the lettering. You know, you want to kind of look at it and it's like, okay, what am I going to put in there? Am I going to fill it with, with a color? Am I going to, you know, liver of sulfur and silver? Or, or is it just going to be um, text? try and, and figure out a way that you can make those letters as shallow as you can get away with still looking good. Um, especially if you're working with thick pieces um, and usually the lettering happens to, to be in thick pieces. 
So you can see on the very top, the, the thinner pieces and the thicker pieces, when that resin goes through that heated transformation stage, it, uh, it, it's, it wants to swell a little bit and anything that's in its way, it's, it's gonna try and take out. So, so if on the, the lettering, if you look at the very bottom of the lettering, I've filleted those edges just so that it's, um, you don't have as much shear in there. If it's a right angle, sometimes it's, it's a lot easier to break off than if it's, it's a filleted edge, it's just a little bit stronger. Um, so all of these little things that you can do just to avoid problems before they, they start to show up. Um, and, and again, don't um, make a two millimeter deep letter if you can get by with a, a half a millimeter or a millimeter. So you just want to look at the piece and say, okay, what's the least depth that I can get away with? Because the deeper it is, the more apt it's going to be to, to create problems. So. And the same thinking goes along with stone settings. Um, most people, when they make a stone setting, they're going to just put a hole, uh, a through hole right underneath the stone. Um, this is the preferred way that I would go about it, is if you look at the, the cutaway on the, the top left, it's tapered a little bit. And then as it breaks down into the, the thicker part of the ring, it's actually opened up a lot more because this will support that investment a lot better than if you just had a, a through hole. Because if you, um, I got a picture, but I wanna show you a little bit better as well. So imagine that piece of investment, say it's, half a millimeter in thickness and it's going from the bottom of the uh, the stone setting all the way through that ring so you've got say here's this is a, a toothpick but imagine that that's investment so you've got this long thin piece of investment that goes all the way through the ring well when that ring is is in resin and it heats up and it starts to swell this is gonna be very fragile. And the first thing that's gonna happen is that's just gonna snap off. So you got this area here that's got a little divot there and a little divot there, but when that metal comes in and when you're casting metal, picture that metal going through these pieces at about 20 miles an hour, because that's probably at the speed when you cast how metal is going in there. And it's going to, anything that's in its way that's fragile is gonna bust off. So you've got this piece here and the metal's coming in. First thing it's gonna do is snap this off. That's gonna go tumbling around in your metal and it's gonna end up somewhere else. And that's where your inclusions come from. So if you th think about that stuff before you actually get there, say, okay, what can I do to strengthen these fragile parts that are gonna end up being investment? So again, you can see, I. Uh, now here's a bad example where I talked about that really thin area so and I actually cast this piece before I did the other one and um, I think four out of the six of these little hole through holes broke off and 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 I tried to you know support the investment a little bit in hopes that I could um, get away with it but it's still um, didn't do it so that's why the other image that was my remedy for um, these pieces that broke off and, and the second casting turned out perfect. So, so again, um, these, these pictures, that's kind of the, the image that I showed of the, the investment with the toothpick. Um, on that last, that back slide, just before this one, if you look at these designs underneath, I don't know if you can see it, but it's got filigree around there, it's got uh, um, mill grain, it's got stones, it's got um, design on the side. The design on the side doesn't necessarily go all the way through, it doesn't have to. So it, it just kind of went through, it was filleted on the bottom. The, the holes through where the stone settings go, they go all the way through. But if you look at the far picture on the, the left-hand side, it's also hollowed out in there. So that's just gonna give everything a lot more um, strength and, and structure to hold all of that investment together when you cast the metal. So, um, so just kind of think about as you're going through these, these, these designs and these castings, okay, how am I going to be able to eliminate um, the, some of these areas that 
could be problems in casting. So, so again, a lot of it is just designing and, and thinking this stuff through before you actually um, get into the, the casting self. So one of the things that, that I do again is I'll, I'll over sprue the piece. Um, this one had a pretty good sprue on the bottom and it had one feeder sprue to the top just because there wasn't really a lot of area that I could sprue this thing from because wherever I sprued it, there was design. So I just had to, uh, you know, kind of support it from the very bottom and then uh, make sure that it had a little bit of feed as well. So this one turned out pretty good. Um, so again, this is, um, here's some examples of what I was talking about. This was some, some pieces that we did some, some testing for. And if you look, you know, luckily before I cast this piece, I took my, my flask and I turned it upside down and tapped it on the table. This is what came out. So this was already busted off in before the metal got in there. And that was just because that ring was very thick in that area. You can see on the far left where those pieces broke out. Um, that thick resin, when it transformed from, from a solid to a whatever it does, it, it swells a little bit. And if you've got unsupported pieces of investment, they're going to snap off right away. So you can see these two little areas here, they actually broke off. And, and this was um, a probably about a millimeter and a quarter deep. Um, we could have, you know, got by with half of that thickness. Um, but you can see this was not even, this was before the metal got in there. This was just from the burnout process. So it's, it's actually looking at some of these areas and it's shearing off pieces of investment that are uh, just kind of weak areas and unsupported. And especially if you've got thicker areas, that's gonna be um, uh, intensified even that much more. So, so again, take a look at your design and it's like, okay, so I wanna stamp on the inside. How deep does that stamp need to be and still be legible? You know, it doesn't need to be a millimeter thick. It could get by with, you know, half a millimeter or less, you know, depending on how much cleanup you've got. So this is, these are some of the things that you would uh, evaluate before you went into the design itself. You know, and you can see that the stone settings and all of that turned out good on this ring, but that uh, just that inside stamp just didn't um, survive just because of the way that uh, the thick resin uh, attacked that thin um, area where it was stamped out. So, so just kind of keep an eye on these things and, and, and look um, and, and evaluate them before they actually get in there. Um, and especially lettering. Lettering has got a bunch of sharp edges and thin areas, the centers of O's and A's and R's and all that stuff is, is just very fragile. And, and when that resin, you know, with, with wax, it's no problem because that wax just melts out. So there's really nothing that's uh, um, affecting the, the uh, investment, but with the resin, it's, it's transforming a little bit in there and any thin areas and, and fragile areas, it's gonna bust those out. So, so one of the things I like to do is, is um, especially in lettering, taper everything so that you don't have, you know, just straight up and down, but just a little bit of a taper so that the, the, uh, um, the base of that investment is, is supported a little bit more. Control your depth, um, figure out what's the, the narrowest I can get by and still look good. And then you know, if possible, go ahead and fillet your edges and that'll just add a little bit more strength to, to your investment as well. And, and again, with the stone settings, um, evaluate your stone settings and do they need a, a thin through hole? Can you get by with a thicker through hole or can you get by with a divot with no through hole? And then once you get it in metal, go ahead and drill them out that way. Um, <clears throat> Here's another way that I kind of get around that. There's some pieces that that's got a lot of lettering and you know it might take three or four or five times of casting before you get a good one. Um, what I've done in the past is I'll take the, uh, the rugged resin um, and just print it out with a sprue on it and make a, a Castaldo mold out of it. It'll survive the heat because you know when you make a mold, it's only 300 degrees. Uh, this resin doesn't break down until about 700. So um, I will actually make a mold of some of these um, finer pieces 
and then inject the wax and cast the wax. It's just one way that you can get around um, having to successfully try and cast a, a piece, a big piece with a lot of lettering over and over. And I've also done this with, um, you know, our TV molds, it works good. I've done it with um, the emerald resin as well. Um, the emerald resin, when it gets up to 300 degrees under that pressure, sometimes um, it'll break a little bit and you'll get fractures and you can get to kind of figure out ways to figure, to work around it. But with this rugged, it works really good. So I've, I've made a lot of molds on, on rugged pieces just so that I don't have to um, deal with, with some of the, the letters breaking out and stuff. And usually it's the real fine areas, the insides of A's and, and O's and, and all that stuff is, is um, has a tendency of breaking out. So it's just a lot cleaner for me if I can just say, you know what, I'm just going to make a mold of this and, and do it once, especially if I'm doing multiples of something. So, so this is just an example of, of uh, how I would make a mold. And, and I've also done, you know, pendants and earrings as well. I, I've, I've done a couple of rings, but usually they don't turn out as well just because under the pressure, they deform pretty good. So uh, usually on the flats and stuff that I have problems with, I'll just make a mold and uh, be done with it. So <clears throat> um, when I'm cleaning, um, the, the little deal on the, the left-hand side is, is how I used to clean. And all that is, is just a, um, like a, a tea maker. When I was in China, I found these things and it was the coolest thing that I'd ever seen as far as cleaning resins. So, so it's got a little, um, strainer on the top and that only fits in the top and then you pour your isopropyl alcohol in the bottom put the lid on it and turn it upside down shake it and and it'll clean really well so I had a number of these I had a, a clean one and then a, a pre-clean one so I would go through two stages um, and then um, it worked out well and then I finally got a, a, a b9 clean unit and uh, I haven't used my my tea makers since but uh, they, they work out good. You know, it's just a, an inexpensive alternative to cleaning that stuff out. And, and I would just put the pieces in the basket itself. And, uh, I, you know, and then I would clean them out pretty good. And I've also taken pieces and put them in, in baskets in my ultrasonic and, and, and Ziploc bags and stuff like that. It all works good, but there's just quicker, quicker ways of, of getting things done. And, uh, um, and they, they all work good, but you just want to make sure that your pieces are clean um, before you, you go into curing them. Otherwise, you'll get some kind of film across it and the, and the edges and the sharpness it won't be there just because it's got extra resin on the surface. So you just want to make sure that that's all off of there. Um, and again, on the right, you can see what I used to do to cure the pieces is uh, put it in a, a Pyrex um, bowl and use a fingernail UV curing light. Um, and it worked okay. You know, I would have to cure them depending on the thickness of the piece, um, you know, half hour or more, but uh, it, it worked good. Uh, and again, when you're curing your pieces, um, it's the time is all based on the thickness of the piece. So if you've got a piece that's real thick, um, you know, even in my uh, my model curing unit that I use now, um, I'll still cure it for half an hour, um, even though it only goes up to nine minutes. I'll go through you know that nine minute um, cleaning um, phase three or four or five times just to make sure that it's completely cured. Because if you don't cure um, your resin before casting, it's going to um, have a a, a weird effect on the surface because that surface is going to react with the investment and uh, you're not going to be happy with it. And that's another thing that you want to be able to identify when you look at your castings and say, okay, is this, is this an inclusion? Is it porosity or is it um, a bad surface because my model wasn't cured before I went into casting? Um, if it's not cured, that that resin is going to react with the surface of your investment and uh, it, it, it's not pretty. So, so you gotta learn how to identify that as well. Um, another thing that, uh, that I've done um, is, but you always wanna cure in water as well. But um, I've taken on a, on a nice summer day, I'll take a, a, my Pyrex um, beaker of water and 
put my pieces in it and put it out on the hood of my pickup for for a half hour to an hour the sun will will uh, give it that uv curing that that i need so um, now in, in investment uh, there's a couple of types of investment that i use um, i'll use uh, just regular straight um, satin cast 20 um, or the uh, the r and r ultra vest and i i've never really used the uh, the platinum based ones because it i can get the same effect if i add uh, boric powdered boric acid to my investment and instead of adding it to the investment what i actually do is i add it to my water so i take and i've got a a jug of boric acid water that i use for casting the resins um, and and i usually only do it on the pieces that have detail and stuff like that if if a piece doesn't have detail or if it doesn't have a, a bunch of thin areas that have a tendency of breaking off i just use the straight um, satin cast or ultra vest um, without any additives and and i get a good result but on those pieces that are fragile that do have a tendency of breaking out I'll take in about five tablespoons of powdered boric acid per gallon of water. And so I'll get a, a gallon of water, usually hot water, and I'll put five tablespoons of this powdered boric acid in it, mix it up and then let it sit aside. And when it cools down to room temperature, that's when I can use it. Um, you can order the powdered boric acid from your, you know, wherever you buy it, um, or you can go to your, your local hardware store or, or Walmart and for a lot less that you can see this stuff on the side is called roach away. Um, and, and if you look at the active ingredient, it's 99% powdered boric acid. And it says 1% other ingredients just because I think they can't control. You know, so, so, so pretty much it's pure powdered boric acid. And it's a lot cheaper than, than you know, getting your, your powdered boric acid from you know, wherever you would buy it. Um, but uh, this is just a, a little trick that I use, you know, especially if, if you're uh, needing boric acid and you can't find any, just go to your hardware store and, and uh, look for roach away. And uh, there you go. And so uh, burnout schedules on B9, they have a burnout schedule that they suggest, and, and I use that quite a bit. But I seem to have pretty good luck with my own burnout schedule, which is like five or six hours. So what I will do is, is once I have my piece cured, I will invest it and I'll let it set aside for a minimum hour um, to an hour and a half, and then I'll put it in my oven and I ramp it as quick as I can up to 1350. Um, and it's, uh, I think my, my oven set at 21 degrees per minute in it. So it gets to 1350 in about an hour. And then I'll let it sit there for three hours so that that resin burns completely out. Um, and then I'll drop it down to my casting temperature, which on most, most pieces is 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I'll let it sit there for an hour, and then I'll cast. Um, these, these numbers might vary. If you're using bigger flasks, you might want to let it stabilize a little bit longer. Um, but this is what I usually use um, and it works well you know the you know a lot of people that say that you get up to 700 degrees and or you let it sit at you know 300 degrees so that it dries out and then you get it up to 700 degrees so that the the resin um, gets out of there a little bit better and stuff and and I don't know the science behind it I just know that that this works for me and I get pretty good results this way. And, and to me, the reason I did it is because I know that between seven and 900 degrees, that resin is starting to react. Um, and, and I just figured, you know what, I'm just gonna blow by that as quick as possible and, and let it do its thing and then get it up to temperature so that it burns out quick. Um, and again, for the most part, this is my burnout schedule. You know, if I'm burning out overnight, I'll, I'll use the longer one, but usually I'll, I'll come in in the morning um, and tree up and invest and, and usually I'm, I'm casted by one o'clock or so and then I can clean up the piece and get it going. Um, he's, here's are some of the pieces that, that I, I did for B9 um, a little while ago and these were all using that, uh, that five hour burnout 
you can see the, the, the ring on the far left, uh, it's all hollow. It's got a, uh, it's a dome piece, but underneath it, it's all hollow. It's got kind of a grid work on the base of the inside shank, um, but everything else was a stone setting. Um, and the, the pieces, uh, uh, the other pieces are all just really fine work, um, it, but it, uh, it cast out well. And again, you, you got to look at the piece and, and say, okay, how am I going to sprue this thing? So on this, the one on the far left, I had a, a sprue on the bottom. I had a couple of sprues on the, the shoulders. And then I had a couple of sprues on the inside of the shank on the very bottom, um, at the bottom of the, the, the ring itself or the top, just so that, um, again, it would feed a little bit better. Um, and because these, these pieces were really fine work. So, um, you needed to control your feed pretty well. Piece in the in the the second one, I I had a sprue that went to every one of those flat areas on the top, also the the shank itself and on the inside. So I, I probably had seven or eight sprues on that thing. Um, the one on the the next one was kind of the same way, just kind of wherever you can get by with adding a sprue, just so that these fine pieces will will fill. Um, I think the one on the far right, I just had a couple of sprues on that one. And, and they all turn out well. So um, again, when I, you know, and one of the questions that people will ask me is, well, why don't you um, sprue the model itself? You know, you can design your sprue into it. And, and I do that at some point and, and sometimes I do, but again, when I, um, you know, th this theory that I have, and I don't know if it's true or not, but it's that where that resin kind of swells, right before it starts to dissolve. If there's places in the model itself or the, the casting that will absorb some of that swelling, it will cause less damage. So, um, so if I put wax sprues on there, that wax is gonna burn out first. And then when the resin starts to um, kind of do its thing, it's got these areas that are releasing the pressure. So if you've got three or four or five or six sprues on that thing in wax, and when that resin starts to um, swell, it's got these portals that absorbing some of that swelling pressure so that it's causing less damage to the, the investment. Um, that's, that's my theory, you know, and it seems to work out all right. So, so there's some times where I will actually create a, a piece with design with the um, sprue in place. But that sprue is reacting the same way the model is. So, so there's nowhere for the, the pressure of the swelling resin to release other than where the sprue is placed on the tree. You know? So if I've got these areas on the design, especially in the thicker areas that are releasing that pressure, then it seems to... Uh, create less damage on the finer areas in the investment. So, so uh, yeah, that's, I guess that those are some of the, the tips and tricks that I can kind of uh, share today. Um, again, I've got a, a, a jewelrymonk.com website where I, I, I do a lot of uh, training and stuff like that, but it's more towards uh, beginner to intermediate jewelers. I've also got a consulting site and then I've got a, a jewelry factory itself it's called Jewelry by Decori. Uh, we got a line, lines of jewelry that we produce as well. So, so uh, I think if, if we're done with this, if there's anybody that has any questions, we can definitely uh, try and tackle a few of them anyway. And if you're looking for something a little more hands-off and at the beginner level, we do have a casting guide as a free resource you can look into. Uh, the guide was developed from customer input, including Doug. So if you would like to look into that, you can go ahead and use that URL at the bottom, b9c.com slash casting guide. And as Doug said, if you have any questions, we will move into those now. The first one we have for you, Doug, why do I get porosity right where the sprue attaches to the thick area? Um, sometimes if, if your sprue isn't, um, say if you take a cross, cross section of that thick area, and if your sprue isn't thicker than that cross section, so even though it's sprued there, it's really not thicker. So if you're, if you're having that, just try a bigger sprue where it's attached. 
So, so again, it's, it's not looking at um, just being sprued there, but it's looking at is, is it freezing off before the ring itself is freezing off? So when it goes from that liquid state to a solid state, say your shoulders or your ring might be three millimeters or four millimeters wide, and you got a two millimeter sprue on it, that's gonna freeze off first. And your thick area is still a puddle of liquid molten metal that's drawing into itself and it has nowhere to pull to. So if you're, if you're doing that, just try a bigger sprue. All right, and the next question, is there a preferred method to support fine detailed text and detail that is prone to breakaway? Um, can you speak a little bit on induction versus centrifugal casting me methods? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and I don't do much uh, centrifugal casting anymore. I've got a couple of them, but I just haven't used them. Um, another thing that you can keep in mind is, again, that investment, um, if if you're working with the fine detail with the lettering and stuff like that, you either use the, the um, platinum casting or the boric acid, but also um, look at how the piece is sprued because you've got those uh, investment areas. And if your piece is sprued so that the metal is coming in and shooting across those areas, sometimes those are gonna break off. So if you can, place your sprue so it's not a necessarily a direct hit into those finer areas. So that instead of, um, say you get your text here and you got your sprue coming in here and it's coming in there, maybe have it come this way so that it's, it's more of a gradual fill and it's not that uh, jet of, of molten metal that's going into those tender areas. Give that a try. All right, and the next one here. For burnout, uh, when you bump the temperature straight up to 1350, are you always using boric acid in the water? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. If the, if the pieces are, are um, um, have a tendency of you know, thin areas and fragile areas, I will. But if it's, if it's not, I'll just use straight up uh, satin cast or ultra vest, whichever one. I, I use them both. <clears throat> And, and I don't seem to seem to notice the difference in either one, so. And have you had success casting stones in place with resin? I've never tried, um, but you know, I, I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, you just have to, when, when you cast stones in place, you gotta make sure that your stone is elevated and just held by the prongs and not necessarily um, laying on the, the resin itself. Um, so, but uh, I don't see why it wouldn't work. You know, I, I used to do quite a bit of uh, stone in place casting, but it was all done in wax, but I've never um, had the need to do it in, in the resin. All right, and I think we will make this our last question. We'll pull the other ones into our Q&A at the end of your session here. Um, what angle do you recommend for letter walls? Five degree, 10? Um, I, I usually go at like five degrees. So it's not, it's not a huge angle so that you would really notice it, but it's just enough to where um, it supports the, the base of the investment a little bit more. Um, but you can get away, you know, if, if it's not going to affect the design, the, uh, the, the more the better. But, you know, at a five degree angle, you're not going to notice it that much. If you go 10 or 15 degree, you're going to notice it a little bit more. But if, it, if the design is not necessarily affected by the look of it, then I would go as, uh, as much as you could. All right. And we are going to go ahead and kick off our Q&A with the panelists. Uh, first, we want to start with our raffle winner, who is Robert Walmsley. Um, be expecting an email from us. You'll be able to choose a free post-processing accessory, or we can get you some free resin. Um, so if our panelists are ready here, we can uh, start with some questions. All right, Doug, this one would be for you. You taper smaller from surface going down on engraved letters. How do you do raised letters? Um, kind of the same thing, but um, usually on the raised letters, you, you have to go pretty much straight up. But on the very top of the raised letters, if you can get by with filleting that edge just a little bit, that'll help to support that investment. Awesome. And do you usually have to scale models for shrinkage? Um, you know, just regular casting shrinkage and cleanup. So I usually do about a two or 3% um, scale, but, but usually I do that 
um, when I'm designing. So if I bring in stuff, I'll, I'll actually size the, the stones um, so that everything fits. So then I don't have to scale it um, when it's all done. So. And how do you divest from casting with the boric acid? And somebody said it seems difficult. It, it's it's a little bit harder because what that boric acid is is almost like a ceramic. So when you heat that up, it turns into it glazes. So you you take your hot flask and you put it in water and you realize it doesn't do anything. It just sits there and bubbles a little bit. And so so I'll take a like a, a small or medium sized ball peen hammer and you just take the flask and you just slowly tap it around the side and eventually it'll it'll break some of that stuff off and then you can pull the the investment out and then you just kind of break it out so um, you can do it that way some of the the blast machines will do that as well but but yeah you will have to take a hammer and, and i mean you don't want to bang on it because you're going to be ruining your flasks but just kind of slowly tap it rotate it and tap it rotate it and tap it, and eventually that investment will break away so that you can you can get your piece out of there awesome thank you doug all right now we have a few questions or this first one here is probably going to be for you kent um, is edge softening a rhino function that can be applied to panther models? Um, yeah, I mean, once once a panther model is made, it's just it's the same as any other 3DM that was designed in Rhino, and so uh, yeah, you can you can certainly apply that in any other way. Uh, I always try to do edge softening in the model first, if that's, uh, especially after listening uh, to Doug um, during his webinar. I mean, anytime I can, I like to fill it a corner or round it um, at the curve level. And then as it ripples through the model, um, you get smooth edges uh, all throughout the process. Awesome. Doug, do you have a 14K white casting grain that you have had the best luck casting using red, resin models? Um, usually the, the 14K that I get, I just get from Stellar. So it's their, you know, their basic white. Um, but and, I have noticed that, that you'll get a little bit better results if you use um, um, fresh versus, uh, you know, recycled metal. Um, you get a little bit better surface. Um, than, than if you, you know, go 50-50 or even old metal. So whenever possible, just try and use um, fresh uh, casting grain. And what kinds of features tend to be a no-go for resin printing? As far as casting? Yes. Um, you know, really, really fine work. I mean, like that, the, those pieces that I showed earlier, there was some of those that were like borderline. So if you've got a, a lot of filigree work with unsupported areas, so you always got to look at those things. It's like, how's the metal going to get, you know, across uh, an inch and a half span with, you know, hairline, um, you know, areas. So you got, and with nothing to sprue it to. So you just kind of kind of look at it and say, okay, first, is it going to be strong enough to, to survive? Uh, the investment process. Two, is it going to have areas uh, to allow you to sprue it so that you've got feed? Um, and if not, what, what I've done in the past is you take your model and you break it up into two or three pieces um, and cast them in different pieces and then either solder them or laser them together afterwards. And you don't have to, just because the model is one piece, you don't have to attack it that way. You can, you can make it in, in multiple pieces and then attach it to the bench. And what do you think is the best resin for casting? Um, the, like I said, I, I use both Satin 20, Satin Cast 20 um, and Ultra Vest and they work, you know, they both work all right. Um, I've never really played that much with the, the, the Platinum Cast, but uh, um, I would suggest, you know, trying, trying whatever you can and, and get some successful casts and set your baseline so that you know, okay, this is a mixture that I want. This is a, the temperature of the water that I'm using. This is 
uh, the time and stuff like that. So if you can set those baselines and get successful castings, then every time you do it, you want to use those specific parameters so that if things break down, then, okay, I haven't changed this, I haven't changed this. So is it the model? Is it, uh, you know, other things that could be um, changing? So, so again, set your baseline good and uh, follow that as close as possible. Awesome. And what about resin? Is there a specific one that you think is best for casting? You know, I've I've usually used the emerald. Um, I've used the the yellow as well, um, and and some of the I, I don't have the the fast wax, but I've experimented with it a little bit, and and they all give me pretty good results. So I I usually just stick with the the, the emerald, just because it's something that I'm I'm used to using and. And again, I, I don't like to change things up that work. So, um, you know, it, I'll, I'll use my emerald because I get pretty good results. And, and sometimes I'll, I'll play around and, and go back to the, the yellow just because I got a bunch of it. But I don't, um, I don't have any of the fast wax just because there's some, some different processes you got to go to to make sure that the, you get fills um, in the resins and in the printing as well. So. Um, again, if something works for me, I, I try and stick with it and, and uh, that's good. Awesome. <laughs> Kent, we had a question here about the pricing of Panther, if you don't mind explaining that a little bit. Sure. There's um, actually two versions of Panther. There's the full commercial version, and that is $2,995 US. So call it three grand. And then there's an entry level called Panther Cub, and it has some limited functionality, and that is uh, exactly half that price. Great, thank you for that. Can, can, can Panther be used offline? Um, yes. Um, one other question that comes up a lot with Panther, it does not have to be online the whole time. Some softwares have to be, um, have an internet connection the whole time. Uh, you can also use Panther on multiple machines as long as they're not running at the same time. So for instance, if someone has Panther at the workplace, then they can run Panther there. As long as they shut it down, their license will be put up into a, the cloud. And then when you go home, uh, you can access that license and run Panther again on a different computer. All right, we have a question for you now, Cody. Um, when it comes to the silicone resin, do you think there will be a way to possibly drop the micron count in the future? For example, from 100 to 50? That's a great question. Um, so while the resin is fairly tricky to make material settings for um, because of its elastomer qualities there, um, I do believe that we are currently working on a lower micron level um, so I think that it is plausible in the future, um, though there may be some time before that releases. And then another question here, kind of a follow-up. What is that silicone resin used for in jewelry? So the silicone uh, resin can actually be used to 3D print the molds themselves. So you, you could actually design in the negative space and as opposed to having to cut, hand cut your own molds, um, you could technically 3D print them uh, and then reuse them until those wear out. And then uh, you can just 3D print the next round. Um, it, it reduces a lot of the risk there, both to the, uh, those cutting the, the molds as well as um, just having to store the molds as well. Uh, so you can reduce inventory there. Great, thank you, Cody. And Doug, what resin are you using to make the molds for wax castings for later use? Are there two different ones? Um, I use the the rugged, the rugged uh, resin for the the RTV or the uh, the RTV molds, or not the RTV, but the the Castaldo molds. Um, and I do the same on the RTVs if I'm making RTVs. But you can get away with using some of the other resins as well. Just the rugged seems to hold up a little bit better under the heat and the pressure. And with wax, can you use wax solvent to soften edges? How can you soften finished resin models? Sandpaper. <laughs> you, there's, no, there's no real resin or any uh, um, materials that I found that will soften it up like wax 
like, you know, on wax, you can take um, lighter fluid or, or something and, and soften things up, but I haven't found anything that will, that will work on the resin without, you know, destroying your, your detail and stuff like that. So if you've got edges that you need to uh, soften up a little bit, you know, I'll attack it with, uh, you know, 600 grit sandpaper and then go to a, you know, a little bit finer just to take away those scratches, but that's about the only thing that I've found so far. And Cody, with B9 Brewing software, will it develop where supports cannot intersect the models? Um, that's a tough question. Uh, there are certain scenarios where uh, moving the model or the support arounds even to intersect uh, the models can be um, beneficial to some users, <laughs> while it's not for all. Uh, we can delve into that question more so offline, I would say, uh, to get a better answer there. But um, yeah, that, uh, that is a possibility if, if needed. All right, Doug, back over to you. Have you experimented with ProCAD coding before investing resins? Um, I've, I've done it a couple of times and, uh, um, you know, I just haven't done it a, a whole bunch. Um, so I, I really don't uh, have much to add to that. So. All right. And unless, you know, within these next few seconds, anything else comes in, uh, we're going to finish off during your session, Kent, you mentioned that you had a joke, but you didn't have time for it. And we would love to hear it if you remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, during, during the whole COVID deal, you know, where everybody was, was self-isolating um, and uh, I, I tell different jokes now because back then I used to only tell inside jokes, if you know what I mean. <laughs> you know, that I didn't say they were good jokes, I, Rachel. Uh, yeah, I disagree. It was a pretty great one. <laughs> All right, and I think as of right now, that's gonna conclude our uh, Q&A session. So I would just like to uh, share what our schedule is for tomorrow. Um, everyone can go ahead and, and join us at the same time, 9 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, we're going to start out with designing for 3D printing with Patrick Dobbs, move into 3D scanning for jewelry with Fernando Cortez, um, and then industry trends and emerging technology with Stoller and a member of our B9 Creations team. And then at the end of the day, we'll do another one of these open forums. Cool. I'd like to take this quick opportunity to thank uh, the team at B9 Creations, uh, Rachel and Nicole. It was nice working with you, Doug. I enjoyed learning from your uh, expertise as well. Well, thank Thanks. you. I, was... I, caught, I caught the first half of yours, Kent, so I'll have to go back and watch it just because I was driving across town. <laughs> I hear you. And I, and I actually, I tried to, to get in to watch it, but I was afraid as, as one of the moderators that my face would show up in, in awkward places. So I just <laughs> tried to stay away as much as I could. But thanks again, yeah, Kent. That was uh, good stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thank both of you. Cody as well. Was... Good to see you. Yes. <laughs> and if you would like to learn more about high resolution 3D printing, about how it fits into your business, or more about B9 Creations jewelry solutions specifically, please visit b9c.com slash jewelry. On our website, you can also request a 3D printed sample, request a demo, or book time with one of our solutions experts to learn more. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and I hope to see you all tomorrow. <laughs>